my name is Ben, and this week, warming up for PAX, we've got a show for you with interviews. Right now with me, I have Christian from Imaginary Game Studios with me to answer a few questions. How are you doing, Christian? Hello, I'm doing just swell. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself really quick? I could just read what I got in my PAX email, but it probably would be better coming from you. My name's Christian. I am the founder slash lead developer guy of Imaginary Game Studios. I got into video games all the way back in higher education. I got a master's degree in technical design and production. And from there, I went to go work on Madden 20 and Madden 21 for any sports fans out there. And then I went to go work on Halo Infinite with 343. Uh, leading up through their release. Mm -hmm. After that, having spent a very long time sitting in front of a computer monitor, playing video games and making video games with all of my free time, put on a little bit of extra weight. So I switched gears to work on Imaginary Game Studios' first project, Meticulous, which is a gamified health companion to help you automate your diet and fitness planning. Now that that project is in a pretty good place, you know, I'll still be going back and doing updates to it here and there. I wanted to move on to the next big thing, which is Rogue Climber. And that's the game that we're going to be demoing at PAX West this year, which is all sorts of different genres put into one. It's an action platformer roguelike rage game <laughs> uh, with some vibes from, you know, getting over it with Ben Foddy, Vampire Survivors. And it has kind of a retro look to it i think too it's a very unique retro i think retro is all in fashion nowadays <laughs> i definitely have a uh, a soft spot for retro aesthetics you know my first gaming console was the good old psx but of course back then we didn't call it the psx we just called it a playstation yeah i remember the first time i played on the playstation was at a concert in chicago they had a demo of the playstation outside of the concert you go in there oh that's great yeah it was at cabaret metro i don't know if you're familiar with chicago but it's a very small club no i'm not and i saw a few bands there and tried out the playstation before it do you remember uh, what game you it, they had you playing i want to say bloody roar i want to say oh, it was let's bloody see. roar that's a good one yeah it's classic for Meticulous, is that available on iPhones? Meticulous is currently only available on PC and Mac on Steam. I do have plans to create a free companion app to go along with it for mobile. That will be uh, some, something for, for the future to work on. Cool. Yeah, so like you can transfer your data or take the data from the pedometer or whatever on the... Yeah, Meticulous serves as a tool for planning out your your meals and your exercises for the week okay and there's a real nice high-tech fancy algorithm behind the scenes so that once you've put in the kinds of recipes that you like to cook with and the kind of workouts that you like to do you can just click a button and then based on what your health and fitness goals are it'll populate your full week's worth of meals to eat and exercises to engage in wow. so what i would love to see on a companion app for that yeah. would then be for exercising purposes a way to manage your progressive overload so how do you ramp up the intensity of your exercise over time and then on the diet side of things a grocery list and a, and a recipe list so that once you figured out what foods you're gonna eat for the week you can get a full list of everything that you need to buy at the grocery store the next time you go shopping yep. and when you sit down to actually cook the food you'll know exactly what it is that you need to cook with yeah very cool so you sound like you've got some major plans for Meticulous. In between that, what got you started on Rogue Climber? So for me, Rogue Climber is my way of finding the fun and the magic spark that really gets me excited about designing and developing video games. Mm -hmm. You know, Meticulous, I've, I think, does a really good job of balancing being an educational and useful experience mm -hmm. while at the same time being engaging and, you know, fun to interact with the mascot character medic. But I really just wanted to take some time and just go crazy with all of the fun design ideas that have been bubbling up in my mind for making and designing video games throughout the past year or so of, of making meticulous. So yeah. Rogue Climber in a lot of ways is, is a way for me to excise those design demons and as far as this specific project 
you know, I think in the, the indie space recently, we've seen a lot of titles that are heavily derivative of other titles. It's almost starting to feel kind of like its own genre, its own creative process of how you derive projects from other projects. Yeah. Where once upon a time, maybe even before the term cozy game came to be, uh, you would sit down and you'd say, all right, I want to make a cozy kind of a game, something that's fun to to chill with and to relax. Mm -hmm. And now these days, the genre has become such an important part of the design process that it seems to me like so many of these indie games come out and they say, it's not just that I want to make a cozy game, but it's like, I want to make either an Animal Crossing game or I want to make a Stardew Valley game. Mm -hmm. And that's their starting point. And they end up somewhere very close to that. So Rogue Climber is kind of a way for me to really play with that idea of genre and make the distinction between what makes those games like getting over it with Bennett Foddy and Vampire Survivors fun and interesting, while at the same time using them as inspirations rather than using them as strict guidelines for what the game needs to be. Yeah. Were there any personal experiences behind this? That is the answer to the first question. Is that correct? Just that what you said there, as far as your inspirations or stories behind why a climber? Why? Yeah, it's kind of my experience is playing a lot of these other games that I see in the indie space and seeing all the great games that are coming out, but then just feeling that that need, like there's something more that we can do when we set out to make a new indie project and design a new game here that doesn't need to rely so strictly on the paradigms of the genre. Yeah. And that's the thing too. I mean, a lot of those, the cozy, I mean, isn't that just a term that people are just throwing around now as far as, Hey, this is a cozy game. And it turns out it's a board game. (laughs) Hey, this is a cozy game. And it's, you know, it turns out it's something like a clicker or, you know, sure. I mean, (laughs) yeah, it just seems like it's being used in a way that isn't, you know, like back when people were saying everything's like, oh, this is a Metroidvania. Yeah. <laughs> Which let's not even get into Metroidvania because that is something that just that it's like, just call it up 2D side scroller platform. Don't label it that because you could have inspirations from those things. But I mean, the flavor of the month, what do you think that is currently? Because it seems like, was it Vampire Survivors for a while there was was yeah. kind of the thing that everyone was trying to duplicate or iterate on. It's a tough call to say what the current flavor is, because that was definitely a recent one. Cozy Games were definitely recent. Mm-hmm. Metroidvanias were definitely a big one. And honestly, I... I kind of want to throw some of the blame to the way Steam is structured, because Steam is the biggest PC game platform, or even the biggest indie game platform. If you want to make an indie game and sell it to people, Steam probably should be your first target. And the way Steam works is it's all about those buzzwords. It's all about those tags that you can apply to your project. And I know that's one problem or one challenge that I've run into with meticulous is trying to figure out how to categorize it according to steam's words Mm. and for a gamified health companion there's not a lot of existing genres that steam can use to bubble it to the top or who do you recommend these games to Mm -hmm. because that's kind of how the algorithm of steam recommendations works and so when there's something that hits when you've got something like the word metroidvania that you can attach to your game you've got something like uh, like cozy that you can put on there yeah. and it's popular, then all of a sudden your game is going to get way more visibility. Yeah, even if it doesn't quite fit. Yeah, I'm sure you and, and your listeners have had the same experience where like you think, oh, you know, it's been a while since I've played an RPG. So let me go see what the latest RPGs are on Steam. And then like the top 10 games are going to be like Call of Duty and it's like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Right, right. It's all about the clicks. And as you get larger and larger, a wider selection of indie titles available on something like Steam, you can have the best game out there, but unless you're getting the clicks, unless you're getting the views of people, you're not going to rise to the top of that, even if you do have the correct tags. A lot of it is view-based, isn't it? That's definitely a big part of it, and why I'm super glad to have the opportunity to do things like PAX to hopefully 
cut through some of the social media algorithm overlords that seem to rule over most of our <laughs> lives these days. <laughs> I'm looking at I'm, uh, the cyber truck. Let's not, uh, <laughs> Does he I've know what of those in my town lately? There's there's a new silver one and a new black one driving around. I'm in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, I see a couple that come into the Starbucks I like to hang out at. <laughs> it's just someone needs to teach that guy what a truck is. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it looks like one of those Cub Scout. Are you uh, old enough to know uh, Cub Scouts, Pinewood Derby kind of? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It looks like just, you know, just like that. You just saw off a couple of edges. <laughs> Totally. A hundred percent. Say what you will. At least, you know, I look at that car and I can recognize what it is yeah. compared to a lot of the other stuff driving around on the roads these days. Yeah. But that's, that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. Uh, did you get yours in Fortnite? Apparently you can get the Cybertruck in Fortnite. I have not played Fortnite for a very, very long time. For a Fortnite? <laughs> for several Fortnites. <laughs> I don't. I wouldn't even recognize it at this point. I don't think I played uh, like one of the. I feel like it must have been one of the very first microtransactions in the game, and I bought like a Raven Crow outfit for my character. It's like black and feathery. Yeah, and that's the only thing I've ever purchased in that game. I've never bought a V buck. I don't know how much a V buck is worth. So I'm gonna make myself sound really old to some people and really young to others. Yeah, that's the thing with gaming and just generations. All of my experience with video games started back in the 70s at arcades, pinball, and, you know, just going to the arcade, putting a quarter in there, playing Gorf or playing Galaxian or whatever, and it just kind of advanced, iterated. I would say arcades were kind of where I learned how to communicate and talk to people, whereas you have your chat things going on these days. There was some toxicity there also in the arcades, by the way. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, <laughs> but not to the scale that we've got now with social media and streaming and all that. Well, those kids, you could see them again if you go again next week, you know? Yeah. No, but I'm, I'm with you. I think, I think maybe that like pure arcade experience that you'd, you know, that you'd recognize from any of the 80s nostalgia movies that have arcades in them these days uh-huh. is just a little bit before me. You know, I had a little arcade in like my local bowling alley growing up that I had a lot of fun in. But I will say I spent a lot of time over in Japan, like going to a Tokyo Game Show. And I, you know, I spent a year there abroad in, in my college years and I've gone back several times since. But the Japan arcade scene, that's where it's at. They got, they, they still got that going strong. So it's, it's great to be able to go and uh, see a real live breathing arcade in 2024. Right. I mean, there are a lot of reasons I want to go to Tokyo. The arcade scene is one of them. Going to Super Potato is another one. Mm, yeah, I don't know Super how Potato. amazing Super Potato is, but maybe check out getting some Dreamcast games. Um, yeah. I don't know if you know this about the Dreamcast. They had a Game Shark with the Dreamcast. Okay. If you put the disc in and you load up the loading screen, you don't have to put any codes in or anything. You just say, I want to play the game, and you put on a Japanese game, it tiptoes past the regional settings. Oh, look at that. Yeah. So <laughs> I did not know. A little that. pro tip. They never came out with the vampire games, the the Capcom Vampire Survivor, Darkstalkers they were called over here. But yeah. That was one of my favorite fighting games that was kind of ridiculous that didn't make it to the U.S. for for the Dreamcast. So I digress. This is why my show has one word, (laughs) because this is the kind of show it is. The word, sometimes it's an anchor, sometimes it's a focus. It just helps me keep from going off into the distance like I just did. So... (laughs) So one thing, you mentioned the games that you were inspired by for Rogue Climber. Are there any legitimate climbing experiences in games that you were trying to emulate or figure out? Or is it this is just more of a jumper climber kind of thing? Well, I think like the rest of the Internet at the time of its flash in the pan popularity, I was a big fan of getting over it with Bennett Foddy. Okay. You know, we can safely say that's one of the fundamental PC gaming culture experiences at this point just based on how wonderfully 
frustrating it was <laughs> and is. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those games that sets off its own subgenre that everybody wants to to chase after. Yeah. Uh, you know, like your your pogo stucks. And coming out of getting over it with Ben Afadi, I, I've done a few game jams here and there, you know, week or two long events where you put together a video game from start to finish. Yeah. And I've participated in one a few for a few years called the uh, Desert Bus for Hope Jam. Oh, yeah. Desert Bus. At the same time as the Desert Bus for Hope. That if you're familiar with Desert Bus, it's a game from a long time ago from Penn and Teller, the magicians, right. where you literally just drive a bus from Las Vegas to Tucson, Arizona. And where I'm at, <laughs> it's the full, full on like eight hour trip. And then when you get there, you get one point and you turn back around. So their charity drive is them playing that game nonstop for like a week. It's, it's, it's great. So they must be playing a version that they found on a ROM or something, right? Oh, I'm sure. Cause I, I'm pretty sure it was never released. Uh, was it Smoke and Mirrors? I think the game was that had different games, including Desert Bus on it. Yeah, I think it was Penn and Teller Smoke and Mirrors, and it was supposed to be for the Sega CD, but it was never made. <laughs> That's the one. Uh, and it, it could be a recreation. I'm sure it wouldn't be a terribly challenging game to make with the technology we have in current year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you ever play Airplane Mode? Because that reminds me of desert bus i mean just in a airplane way airplane mode no okay airplane, i'm not familiar with that it is on steam and i think oh it's, yes okay i remember hearing about this one I, I i didn't recognize it from the name but yes i do know this you can find a sleeping pill in your little pack that you can unzip and then take an hour off the trip but that's about it <laughs> <laughs> i mean i don't think they went far enough it's like desert bus you don't really do anything it's not even a game so much as it's just you sit around, you can play some of the little solitaire game on the back end of the seat or whatever, but it's not, it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> and just if anybody's not familiar with this wonderful, magical experience, it is a six hour commercial airline flight in coach. That's it. That's the whole thing. That's wonderful. And will give me horrible flashbacks. To all of my 14 hour plane rides over to Japan. Yeah. If I ever go to Japan, I mean, I should do that as a warm up. you know, <laughs> it's good training, good practice. I'll say every flight over there gets a little bit shorter, but never short. Have you ever slept in one of those capsule hotels? Not a full on capsule hotel. I have stayed in a boutique hotel Okay, where it's where like the bedroom is basically just the size of the bed and like a little space to walk okay. and set your back down. Gotcha. But it's, it's not like full on, you're just in a slot in a wall. You still have a private room, but as is everything in, in Japan, everything is always going to be a little bit smaller than what you're expecting. Yeah. When I was looking over there, I wanted to stay in one of those capsule hotels, but also there's this place called, I think it's private cabin or something, but it was like the whole theme is sleeping on an airplane. <laughs> oh, no. do they have a lot of themed stuff in japan or is that something that we as americans make up you know i think in the u.s we have a very anime centric view of the country right and anime is only one tiny tiny little sliver of the high school boy demographic of the country so mm -hmm. there's a lot more going on there than just made cafes i was gonna ask you about those okay all right it, they're real they're over there i've been to a couple of them they're wonderful they're great but there's also a lot of other cool uh historical cultural things to to spend your time on but i mean that's one of the great things about tokyo there's just so much to do i've been there so many times and every time i go there's always so much more i i still haven't done yeah yeah have you been to studio ghibli is it ghibli or ghibli I've always said Ghibli. They have Ghibli stores. Okay. I don't want to say anywhere, but frequently enough that you'll come across a few of them and they'll have like places where you can take pictures with no face on the train or with a giant Totoro and, and stuff like that. And they'll have all sorts of souvenirs that you can get puzzles, handkerchiefs, cups and plates and stuff like that with all of the Ghibli stuff you could ever want. Cool. I went to the website and you can sign up for like a tour or something, but. Oh, well, speaking of tangents, I went off on this uh, desert bus oh, tangent yeah. without coming back to it. <laughs> uh, okay. One of the Game Jam games I made for Desert Bus for Hope was called Desert Bus Road Rage. And you can play it for free 
Desert Bus Road Rage on, on itch.io. And it was a rage game where you have to drive a bus through the desert, avoiding obstacles, but you're only allowed to interact with one thing in the dashboard of the bus at a time. So if you want to use the steering wheel, you have to specifically look at the steering wheel and turn it. If you want to hit the gas, you got to look at the gas pedal. If you want to hit the brakes, that's a separate thing. If you want to pull the horn to scare all the camels away who are trying to tip you over, that's a separate thing. Wow. And it was a lot of fun because that was t- like the first time I had made an experience that was intentionally frustrating. And it's so satisfying as a designer to see people lose their minds <laughs> as they get tipped over by the camel for the 10th time and they know what they need to do and they're just so they're hooked yeah. on your experience. Right. And that's, I think, what rage games can do in a way that a lot of other genres really struggle to do or really desperately want to achieve, getting you in that place where you're like, oh, just one more try, just one more try. That's definitely a big part of what what I want to get out of uh, people's enjoyment of Rogue Climber. Yeah. Okay. All right. Some rage, some casual rage, cozy rage. You know, you need to make a cozy rage game. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Cozy rage Metroidvania shooter RPG. There we go. A shmup or whatever they call those. Uh, Bullet hell shooter. (laughs) Bullet hell, boss rush. All the words. So your desert bus experience when you did the game jam, was that sort of an exploration that led you to develop rogue climber or was it sort of at the same time uh d- so de- yeah desert bus was was several years ago at okay. this point that, that that was something i made a while ago but as a designer it's you know something that has been stuck in my craw that i've i've always wanted to explore in a, at a deeper level that obviously i'm not going to get a chance to working on the franchise team at madden or on halo infinite because that's not what those experiences are about at least uh, that's not what they're supposed to be about. <laughs> yeah. We can wrap up with the favorite word question and I can ask you just a few quick questions about your experiences in the AAA space and your perception of, on what's going on now and what needs to be done. Just uh, uh, opinions, right? If you have any. Consider me at your disposal. Whatever you think your listeners want to hear, ask away. Well, one of the things is with the downsizing that's occurring, you have successful games. We don't see the bottom line. We don't see uh, the balance sheet or, or anything like that. Time invested, the profit and loss would be income and expenses. But Don't even get me started on accounting as a recent entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. So what is the reason for these layoffs, in your opinion? Is it AI? Is it trying to make more money, make the latest game that's a game as service i mean do you have any idea why for example you worked at electronic arts don't burn any bridges or anything but what are your thoughts on the reason for all the layoffs i mean that's going to be a very big question so take every word i say here with a grain of salt and it is not a reflection of any of the people that i worked with directly i worked with plenty of wonderful people at both organizations i'm going to come out and say it's not going to be ai i don't think ai is any kind of a threat to people's jobs in the game development industry at least not at this stage including actors because i know there's a big they just did the seg after a strike. I'll say I haven't worked directly with audio teams at either of those companies. So this, this again is going to be speculation. Okay. In places that I suspect there to be AI voice usage, it's still going to be trained from a specific voice actor or actress. I mean, my hope would be that they would negotiate in their contracts that I'm going to give you this much material. And if you want to produce additional content with my voice, then that's a part of my paycheck. Right. To me, that's the wonderful future world that we could live in if things go well. You know, I always think back to like Destiny when they had to completely cut Peter Dinklage from the voice of the little robot ghost. Yeah, yeah. Because he was too busy with Game of Thrones to come in and record lines for the DLC. Say what you will about Peter Dinklage's performance as ghost. I know it wasn't everybody's favorite Peter Dinklage showing. But I have to imagine that as a game studio, you would be much more confident in hiring the right people for the right jobs if you 
weren't worried about their future schedules for doing additional content, you know, whatever. But why all the layoffs? To me, I would say root cause, there's been a growing separation from the creative voices and the executive business voices in any one company. That's just going to come as a byproduct of the size of these companies. You know, what once might have been a AAA game made by like 30 people is now a AAA game made by like a thousand people. Mm -hmm. In that kind of an environment, it's going to be so much more difficult to, one, maintain a coherent creative vision, and two, allow the executives and the team leaders to be able to put their full trust in the boots on the ground designers and developers. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a lot of these cases, the companies have kind of grown a little bit big for their britches. And now they're just starting to feel a little bit of that backlash from projects that haven't been as successful as they wanted to be. Is that their expectations being over the mark? You don't see anyone at the upper level, or at least in the news now, let me just say that. I haven't done any <laughs> research on this, but the people who are at the top of the food chain aren't losing their jobs. It seems like if you made the wrong call at that level, that's the person you need to replace, not the people who are the quote-unquote boots on the ground. Well, I would say at every level from the boots on the ground to the executive level, there is a lot of shuffle going on. Okay. Uh, you know, like the real big names, like the Todd Howers might not be switching studios every couple of years, but it seems to me like just about everybody else is. I mean, the vast majority of people that I worked with at both 343 and at EA are no longer with those companies. It doesn't have anything to do with their rank in the company. It's just that's kind of the culture of the industry right now. People move around. And so when people move around, you don't really have as cohesive of a team. And you also don't have that same level of accountability. That's some food for thought from someone who's been in that environment. Okay, well, let's wrap up this interview, quote unquote interview, with the final question, which is, what is your favorite word and why? I'm going to give you the the most uh, boringest, cringiest answer possible. Uh, <laughs> Rogue Climber is, of course, produced by my company, Imaginary Game Studios. I do all sorts of things kind of under that Imaginary Game brand. We, do, we just closed up with the Imaginary Game Jam in July. It was a two-week-long game jam with a thousand bucks that I gave away in cash prizes. It was a ton of fun. All the games were featuring... Uh, Medic, the mascot character from Meticulous. Oh, okay. That's really cool. So if you want to go check out some of the games that were made and that, you can. They're free. And then there's the Imaginary Game News, where every month I do a segment kind of reviewing gaming news uh, that's been going on in the industry. And that's kind of my way to keep up to date on everything that's going around. I also do my own podcast called the Imaginary Game Club, where I play through uh, a more obscure, shorter, accessible game with a different guest each time. So it's all, all, all imaginary game stuff. So it's probably a no great surprise that the word I'm going to have to pick here is going to have to be imagination. That's good. What was the imagination song that was... Uh... Oh, no. <laughs> okay, let's not go there. <laughs> is it Willy Wonka? Is it? I don't know. I think there's a SpongeBob song too. I like that word, that word imagination. My favorite word right now obfuscation oh that's a good one. i don't know why obfuscation is just stuck in my head as my favorite word and has for the last few months i don't know if i'm going to do a show on it my relationship with obfuscation is that there is an ability in the vampire the masquerade rpg and that was quite powerful right so i always wanted to get obfuscate on my character yeah anyway imagination if you ever want to be back on the show, I would love to have you on. We could do Imagination as soon as I confirm that we've not done it before. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. If it's already been done, I'll, I'll see if I can find my number too. We but can, I'd, yeah. I'd be happy to do this again sometime once things uh, slow down after PAX. Very cool. Do you have a channel? If you could just send me an email with the links you want me to include in my show notes, I'll include them. Sure. Great. If you ever want me to be on your show with a game, I'm down for it. Any game, any time, you know? <laughs> Heck yeah. All right. Good to know. Thank you so much, Christian, for joining us on this week's episode of the Two Vague Podcast. We will see you at PAX. 
It's been great chatting with you, Ben. Hope to see you at the booth. And by we, I mean I. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much. Take care. I'll talk to you later. You too. Have a good one. So how are you? Tell me about your uh, Too Vague. I, I'm not familiar with uh, the work that you guys have done. The Too Vague podcast is uh, something I started as a hobby to kind of help me process the death of my father about three years ago. He would hear me being guests on other people's podcasts. And one time we spoke shortly before his death and he was saying how he was wondering when I was going to get into, you know, like doing it because it seemed like I really enjoyed the whole process. And so that was kind of where I started thinking about doing the podcast, recording out of my apartment in Arizona. The show concept is I'm a talker and I love video games. So what I do is I invite people on to talk about a word that they want to talk about. And then at the end, I connect it to video games. So it's very stream of consciousness, some trivia, there's some storytelling, there's all sorts of things, but it's just basically the word is what keeps us focused. Because if I don't have a focus, look out, you're talking to me for hours. So you and I have that in common. So let's be careful here not to spiral <laughs> too far down. Eric from Imaginary Game Studios, are you one of the founders like Christian or is this a cooperative thing between you two or I'm not technically a founder Christian started it all by himself and he uh was nearly done with the first release I say nearly done I'll say it was 60 percent through the first release uh meticulous and uh he called me up and was like what are you doing and I'm like yeah not much He's like you want to help out with some stuff <laughs> and so that's kind of how it <laughs> how it came to be so it's just been the two of us now for gosh a, cu a couple years at this point it's been a while yeah helping out with some stuff what does that mean your role is at imaginary game studios are you a programmer or are you both programmers or christian does all of the actual meaningful work what i do i am uh, just that's a, a general game designer but my focus is a uh, narrative Okay. That being said, when you're on a two man team, you kind of just do whatever you need to. So, you know, I've poked around in Unreal a little bit and I've researched botany and different things for Christian's random flights of fancy for game ideas. And <laughs> I think most importantly, I help him wherever I can design wise. But uh, I'm the first person to play whatever he makes. We'll fire up Discord and I'll share my screen and. I'll jump through, you know, level one or whatever. And I'm like, dude, this sucks. It, it really needs to, it, we really need to tighten up the inertia in this moment. And the, the, this feature here isn't tying very well into things. But he initially brought me on because of my narrative background. So do you come from the AAA space like Christian does? I do. Yep. He and I met while we were working on Madden 20. Yep. We were hired around the same time. I took a liking to him immediately because he... He wasn't a big football guy, and I'm obsessed with the sport, so it was a great fit for me. But he was always looking for ways of making the game. He's like, this game has enough football in it already. Like, it's already hitting all those marks. What about the people that underlie the sport? What if we did some non-obtrusive exploration of those people? So he created a system that never made it into the game, so I think I'm safe to talk about it which most of the stuff that you design in AAA doesn't make it in. It's most of it's cutting room floor stuff, but it was like a psychology system. And each player had a unique psychology and that psychology would respond to who they spent time with, uh, to who you signed to the roster. And it was just this wonderful web that he created. And I remember him presenting it in a meeting and I was like, who the hell is this kid? This is amazing. Like, I can't believe the amount of thought that went into this. And uh, he and I, started exchanging video games. I gave him The Witcher 3, which he, he never beat, by the way. I'm a little, <laughs> still a little salty about that. And uh, started exchanging books and uh, just stayed in touch ever since. Oh, wow. So was all of your experience at Electronic Arts or have you gone to different companies? I have experience with Blizzard around the time that they were launching Diablo 3. So a long time ago. And it seems almost like yesterday to me, but yeah. Well, we waited so long for it. <laughs> it does it does seem like I, I can't believe there's four out already yeah but i did some uh narrative stuff for them i still have like you know my claim to fame my page on the diablo wiki and i wrote some short stories to help them supplement their marketing for diablo 3 interesting very cool that's kind of my foot in the door it wasn't your choice to kill off what's her name was it you talking about the main the the, the heroine yeah uh, who 
No, I got turned into was the vessel. Spoilers, everybody. Spoilers <laughs> for a game that's been around for a very long time. 12 years now, something like that. No, it's actually uh, the way that that worked. I was contracting with a group called uh, Creative Development, and they would have me pitch them story ideas. And so, the, you know, the week leading up to that, I would scribble out whatever kind of interested me uh, just intrinsically. Mm -hmm. And I would go pitch my ideas to the team. They'd take notes and think about things and they'd come back to me a day or two or three later. And they'd say, we really like these three ideas, but they all need to change in these fundamental ways. So I had an idea about an assassin who managed to get just a sliver of a soul stone. Okay. And they fashioned it into almost like this ice pick type of weapon. And they would steal people's souls through their trade, through assassinating people. And then they could sell the souls to different, you know, black market vendors and all that. And they're like, we love that idea, but it can't be a soul stone. And I was like, why not? They said, we can't tell you. <laughs> so all of my friends were like, what's the story of Diablo 3? And I said, I don't know. I'm going to find out at exactly the same time that you guys do. <laughs> So they're very tight lipped as far as all these. I mean, you see in the gaming news, all these people with leaks and things like that, but there is an effort to keep all this story and narrative stuff very, very closed off from everyone, right? There is. And I think for Diablo 3, especially that was the case. And I think Jay Wilson, the game director has come out and said that that was actually a mistake that they made. Oh, because it, it what it, it prevented feedback and iteration. They kept it under such tight lock and key that no one ever had the opportunity to play it and say, you know what? I don't think the girl should die at the end. And yeah. I don't think this should happen. And um, I had my qualms with pregnant witch moving across the planet faster than my barbarian from Diablo 2. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand how that's possible still. But they, it was like top, top secret stuff at that time. I think they've loosened a little bit because they're looking more for that feedback now. And I think that's the thing too with these types of projects is as you go forward, you kind of tweak what your approach is, be it from a gameplay standpoint or from a storytelling standpoint. There are things that you want your audience or the people who are working on these little bits of narrative to know about so they can craft the side stories appropriately mm -hmm. trying to keep these things secret i think that's what the industry wants to do because you don't want leaks but at the same time that's an interesting point that you need to get that feedback and if one piece doesn't work well then the other connecting pieces might not hit as well that's really interesting i asked christian about his thoughts on the industry as far as these layoffs and what's happening in the AAA space. But since you are focused on narrative, I'm going to ask you this. A lot of people for a while there were concerned about censoring the ideas as far as a company not allowing the author or the story writers to present their vision the way that they want to present their vision. Now, a lot of this, I think, is white noise. There's a lot of people complaining, but the people who are satisfied aren't speaking up. It's just the people who are complaining. In your experience, diversity, equity, inclusion, those kinds of concepts, are you concerned when you're writing pieces? Is that something in your mind as an author or as a writer of these stories? It, am I trying to write to satisfy the the hoi polloi, so to speak. The loud minority. They're saying, oh, it's so-and-so is covering this up. They're forcing these things in there because they're told by the higher-ups to do so. Narrative is an interesting thing because it's just words and it's a medium that we all work in because we all communicate. And it's also the easiest thing to change. If an artist spends all day rendering an environment and you're like, you know what, instead of a forest, I think we should do a volcano. In my script, that is a find and replace. In the artist's rig, that's all day, maybe all, all week, right? Right. So narrative gets a lot of that pressure from up above to change this or that. I don't know that I've ever had anyone mandate this character you know, needs to be of, of a minority race or such and such gender or anything like that. I certainly don't pay any attention to it while I'm writing because to me, 
I'm trying to create like a simulacra of a real situation. Mm -hmm. So for instance, when you're writing stories about football, like you are in Madden, there's going to be a lot of diversity in them because that's, that's a reflection of the sport, right? When you're writing something fantastic like Diablo, there's still a lot of diversity. It may not be black, white, transgender, whatever, but you have people with, that have different belief systems that are different ages, that are different genders, that are this and that. I think if you're trying to tell a story in a realistic and meaningful way, a lot of that's going to be taken care of naturally. Now, you always have blind spots, right? right. Like, I'm a, I'm a Latin man, so I may get like a Eastern European accent wrong in my script or something like that. I'm going to need help with that. But it's in the script because I think it's, it's, been, it's an earnest effort to to create some verisimilitude about what I'm trying to write. So it's a hard question to answer. I don't pay any attention to it whatsoever. I let that feedback kind of take care of it for me. Okay. Certain folks were making it sound like book banning almost. And it was just like, no, I'm pretty sure that's not the case. If I'm writing something, I'm writing my perception of these characters, their background, and that's important to the character. So if it is, I go to bat for those ideas, and if not, then I can make those changes. But, I mean, it's not like someone's trying to change this just for the sake of diversity, equity, inclusion. A lot more frequently, you run into the issue where an executive is married to just a really generally bad idea, and they really want to get it in there. Or worse yet, marketing will come interrupt a meeting, and they'll say, like, we promised such and such character was going to be featured on the back of the box. So they need their own storyline. Mm-hmm. And you're like, that doesn't really jive with what we're trying to communicate, but I'll see if I can figure it out. And the two companies I've worked for, that's much more common than the concern about diversity and, and whatnot. Right. Okay. That would make sense to me as well. The too many cooks kind of thing. Big issue. Yeah. If you're the sole writer of so-and-so, well then it's kind of your call. But when you have I mean, how many writers would you say? How many narrative designers were on Diablo 3 in your estimation? With that title, I'm not sure, but I would say their writer's room was five people. Okay, so it's under two digits. The story is a lot easier to get a handle on. I mean, look at a novel, right? A novel many times is more expansive than the games that we play. Absolutely. And uh, written by one person. So you don't need a huge team to do narrative design compared to something like ui ux or just art in general or sound or anything else so yeah you don't need too too many cooks in the kitchen but the risk again is that everyone speaks everyone communicates so they all think that they understand how narrative works and so you get these emails or pop-ins from executives and they're like i think this little girl should be snarkier and you're like she's like an extra what are you talking about this is literal feedback i won't say when and where but the actress that we got to play this little girl is fantastic, and we want her to be the star of this scene now. And I'm like, great, all right. It's a scene about like brotherhood, but cool, let's do it. So yeah, that's that, those are challenging days. But I mean, sometimes the challenges as far as an author is good, right? It may be frustrating because it doesn't fit, but at the same time, it's a challenge to you as a writer. What are your thoughts on that? Creativity is born of constraint. It's just the process. Like you said, if you're not comfortable with that, you're not going to last too, too long. And honestly, if you were just, if someone sat you down and said, make whatever you want, write whatever you want, it probably wouldn't be that good. I feel like that's what happened with Anthem. Remember that from 2020, 2019, whenever that was? Oh boy, do I remember. I was working at EA at that time. And that was a surprise to all of us when that dropped. I was reading the expose that, uh, what was it? Jason Schreier, I think did. Yeah. And the lack of creative constraint on that project was shocking. It was just like, we want to make the Bob Dylan of video games. Well, as a narrative designer, I'm like, well, what the hell does that mean? Like, I can, I can just write anything. Like, what's our budget? What, like, what are we, what, what are we trying to communicate? What message are we trying to get across? Yeah. It's dangerous. Didn't they also have some change of who was leading that group of folks as far as the vision, the direction too? Eventually, yeah, they had to resort to kind of an authoritarian approach where they just needed someone in to say, this project is getting done. We've spent too much money on it. We spent too much time on it. Let's just get it done. And that's what we got, unfortunately. Yeah. 
I think it had a lot of promise. I had a lot of fun with all the flight. A lot of the game mechanics were interesting and fun to me, but the narrative was sort of all over the place and didn't really grab me. But we've covered our very serious questions, so let's get to some fun questions, okay? Let's do it. First question, what sort of personal experiences or stories serve as your inspiration in your role on Rogue Climber? Well, it's not much of a narrative-driven game. Well, at least not overtly. We're working on some stuff behind the scenes. But personal experiences. I used to play a lot of Mm Counter-Strike back when I was in high school. And this was pre-1.6. Back in uh, the olden days of Counter-Strike, bunny hopping was just like an insane thing. Like there was no, you could get your inertia, your momentum going like a million miles an hour and just cover maps just in no time. And people actually built custom maps around this mechanic. And they were these bunny hopping maps. So there'd be like this gigantic tree that you had to climb. It was almost like getting over it in first person mm-hmm. 20 years before getting over it came out. And that, when, when Christian was explaining this concept to me that he wanted to do, I was like, that sounds so much like those Counter-Strike bunny hopping maps. And that has informed a lot of my contributions to the, to the game. I'm like, I kind of want to recreate that experience in a, a more purposeful capacity instead of just taking advantage of a broken aspect of Counter-Strike. Let's actually make a game around it. Yeah. So yeah, I would say that definitely informed a big part of my design philosophy for Rogue Climber. And that kind of fits into the second question, which is which sort of gaming experiences or specific games. Are there any other games that you draw inspiration from other than Counter-Strike in this? I really jumped ahead, didn't I? I should have saved that was a great answer for this question. It's kind of twofold, right? You have some personal stories and experiences on Counter-Strike. It overlaps. There's a Venn diagram there. I'm trying to think. Christian is an interesting developer to collaborate with because he's really obsessive about defying genre, which makes me very uncomfortable as a storyteller. (laughs) (laughs) He was telling me about the thing that he did with the Desert Bus, the not released Sega CD game, Penn and Teller, Smoke and Mirrors. We've talked about it on the show with other folks because it's just ridiculous. Because we talked about when we were talking about the uh, the game Airplane Mode. Have you ever heard of the game Airplane Mode? No. Check it out. It is, uh, it's just a f- intercontinental flight. That's all it is. You're sitting in... What do you, what do, you do? That you take the flight. <laughs> there's a little thing in front of you you can order your food or whatever through the thing you just sit there you hear babies crying you hear um the guy coming over on the speaker it's not really a game it's just kind of a simulator more than it is that's like the uh the the French art film of games yeah pretty much there are little things you can figure out like I figured out You find a little pill, right? If you take that sleeping pill, you just fade out and then an hour has passed. But I mean, that's that's the only thing. It's like, I don't really know what other kind of gamification things there are in it, but it's a simulator of an intercontinental flight, which obviously was made as kind of a middle finger to very similar, I would say, to the Smoke and Mirrors series of games that they had or Desert Bus. Yeah, that Penn and Teller thing, you're taking me way back, man. That is, uh, I have like the foggiest memories of that from being a kid. That's the thing. It never was released. It was just kind of urban legend-ish kind of stuff until finally. Was it, was it like vaporware that they were advertising it and it just never came out or something? I mean, they have mock-ups of the actual cover and the actual games. And Penn and Teller has said they worked on these, these mini games for the Sega CD, but it just never came out. So I'm guessing there was some development time. I didn't do that much research into the whole project beyond that. But I have to Google this after our call. I feel like I'm being Mandela affected right now. I'm like, I swear that there was Sinbad as a genie. But no, that's neither here nor there. Christian defies genre wherever possible. He's just a contrarian person, I guess. So when you talk about like what games inspired Rogue Climber, it's almost more like the game reminds me of, uh, I don't know how much he described it, to you but it's a it's a very challenging and frustrating platformer with roguelite sort of things right yeah you get power-ups and and it's almost an arcadey rogue platforming experience but you're speaking my language with (laughs) arcadey i think one of his favorite games is like gauntlet 
what gauntlet oh, was yeah. there. I yeah. remember what like what the original of top it. down or, or I can't I can't remember if I think it's one of the arcade versions, but the way that he thinks of things is like like the level generation. I won't spoil too much since it's still in development, but the level generation is like it reminds me of Vines climbing a trellis. Oh, okay. The algorithms that he's created to generate the levels. It's not really like anything I've seen in gaming before. I'm sure it's been done and I just haven't been that well versed in it. But uh it's hard to say like what games serve as your, as your inspiration because it's kind of a mishmash of a different bunch of elements from a bunch of things. I could accept all of them if you even <laughs> wanted to say that because, you know, in some cases people do point out specific games and like what, you know, they draw from for their inspiration. But but yeah, I mean it does seem like a one of these genre mashups that is very unique looking and interesting. So, I can't wait to check it out at the show. If my schedule allows it, are you going to be there as well? Yep, I'm going to be. I'm basically his security, I guess. Not really, I mean. <laughs> but uh, I'm holding down the booth. You're the booth babe or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I'm going <laughs> to bring the, the bikini and everything. <laughs> okay, so then finally, we'll close this out with what is your favorite word and why? My favorite word, I think it's a tie between two of them. I've been reading a lot of classics lately. So uh, I've been coming across some really fun ones from like the turn of the 20th century. Okay. Uh, one of them is Scofflaw, S-C-O-F-F-L-A-W. Okay. And it's just what it sounds like. You have no respect for the law, for authority. And I've been using it on my friends just really maliciously for <laughs> years now. It's just a good way to diffuse a situation to call someone a Scofflaw. And the other one, I'm trying to think of where I read it like a hundred years of solitude or something i can't remember but it's bindle stiff b-i-n-d-l-e-s-t-i-f-f it's like the hobo that you see in the cartoons who has the stick on his shoulder and the the, oh. the sack at the end of it yeah bindle stiff and i also have been using that maliciously with friends and colleagues so i need to look you up anytime i want to do a challenging word show <laughs> My friend Andrew, who's usually on the show, we did an episode on the word equivocate recently. I think that's a fun word. It's beautiful to say. There's a lot of there's a lot going on there. Since I work in medical laboratory information software, one of the folks I worked with requested that we do an episode on aliquot. And then one of my favorite words that I want to find someone to do this with is obfuscate. I love the word obfuscate. I use it a lot. But- that interplays with the whole censorship thing as well. Yeah, exactly. That's a good one. I, do you have time for me to ask you a few questions? Sure. I'm just genuinely curious about, uh, really about anyone that decides that they're going to pursue and then socialize a hobby. Where did you uh, come up with the, the word concept? I come from a family of readers. My grandmother, she got to the point where she almost lost her sight, but every day she would break out a large print book, put it on a reader, one of those old fashioned projector readers and read a book. So I kind of, the whole word concept has always been something that's kind of in my DNA from my father's side, just being interested in words and their origins. And, but then also I'm a very stream of consciousness kind of person. And I like doing research on words, but also connecting those to like real events and relaying stories about those things from my past or other folks that I know their past. So it's also something where if I just had a show about nothing or a show just about video games, it would be so annoying to listen to because there wouldn't be a way to really define it. So I use the word as kind of In some cases, it's an anchor point. In some cases, it is the subject or the focus. I didn't know anything about the word rugby. I didn't know anything about rugby, but I did a little bit of research, talked to someone who played rugby on various teams in University of Arizona here in in Tucson. In that case, it was a focus. There's not really a lot to talk about (laughs) other than I don't have any rugby stories. <laughs> the etymology is going to carry us where we need to go. Yeah, exactly. And then also the sport itself and how this person felt about the sport and how she got into it. And so this is like, you know, it's a focus and it's an anchor. That's what the word concept is to me. Tell me about your dad. So you mentioned your grandmother who 
was a habitual reader. Was your father the same way? Yeah, definitely. Much more than I ever was. <laughs> I did read a decent amount, but not to the extent that my father and my grandmother and anyone on my father's side did. I th like to think that a lot of my knowledge of words or vocabulary, a lot of that had to do with interacting with that side of the family. My father came from Indiana, very small town in Indiana, kind of a troublemaker, right? <laughs> Nothing else to do, right? Exactly. But then as he grew, he got into computers and programming after he served some time in, well, not in prison, served, <laughs> served some time. He was in the uh, Marine Reserves. <laughs> close serve some time in the marine reserves uh, <laughs> context is important so he didn't go to college but he got into computing this is like late 60s early 70s time oh so he was like a like an early early adopter yeah very very early they use punch cards my mother went to punch card school and so she was one of the people who were making the punch cards to feed into the computers and then they met each other at an insurance company where they both worked and that's my father through the 70s. I mean, he moved up the ladder in his company. He has no college degree except his master's. He was that brilliant. He went to University of Chicago and has a master's in business from them, but never got his bachelor's. If he was a guest on the podcast, what would his favorite word be? I don't know, man. That's a tough question. For one, I don't think he would ever want to be on the podcast. Why is that? I just don't think he would feel comfortable being on it. His sister, my Aunt Nora, she's been on a number of episodes. Actually, that's another thing that the show kind of helped me, and I like to think helped my aunt kind of get over some of the, you know, missing him. And it's yeah, kind of, of you know, and it also has built our relationship, too. When I first started the show, the joke was that she's the only listener to the show. That's where it started out, but now I've got probably about 20 regular listeners, and that's okay. Just like a small group of people. And I don't do it for anyone other than just myself and just for the hobby of it and just for fun and meeting people. And, you know, I think it's so important to make something meaningful. I've made games that have sold 20 million copies. Let me rephrase. I've been on the staff that made games that sold 20 million copies and I've made games that sold 20 copies. And uh, some of my favorite memories are from the second, the latter example. It's, it's about making something that you think is, is important and valuable, whether or not it reaches a wide audience. Yeah. And uh, I love your rationale for, for doing this. It's almost like a, that form of therapy for you. This is getting a little personal, but when he passed away, there wasn't anything left unsaid. We would talk every weekend, and so it's not like I felt any regret or anything, like I said something before he passed or, or whatever. Sure. We had a very healthy relationship. It wasn't always that way, but it developed into this thing where it was like we would talk every weekend and discuss what was going on. And I didn't take things personally like I used to. And I'd grown as an individual. And I like to think he had grown as an individual. So it was just like nothing other than just missing him. That's that was the piece that I had to wrestle with was just missing him and being able to talk to him. And so this is kind of a way that I can process that and I can share stories about him. I can share stories about growing up or things I learned in my life. And that's just kind of I don't want to say to honor him, but just sort of he's he's sort of the inspiration, right? Well, it's keeping him around. Yeah. I'll ask you one last thing. And if it's too personal, just say no, it's fine. My wife is a therapist, so I think I come by it naturally. You mentioned telling stories about your dad without getting too crazy emotional or too personal into family drama or anything like that. What story do you, of his do you think had the biggest impact on you? Oh, boy. He used to bring the teletype thing. <laughs> this is one I've probably told on the show, too. When he was getting his master's at the University of Chicago, he would bring home. It wasn't a teletype, but it was one of these... It had a keyboard on it and then a segment for your telephone headset in these suction cup things that would communicate. It was like a modem, but very early, right? And he would bring that home for his studies. On that computer, they had the Colossal Cave Adventure 
game there was like 3d tic-tac-toe but for some reason the colossal cave adventure was the one that i was just like oh wow this is really cool and the whole thing printed out on a big sheet of paper i was so excited about that i took it to my kindergarten class to show everyone i was like look i played a game and then just rolled this thing out <laughs> everyone in the, in the kindergarten class had no idea what i was talking about but i was really excited about that so a, yeah what, what is this yeah. yeah exactly this is a game look <laughs> so that's fantastic man and hopefully this is the start of a good friendship because i really enjoyed talking to you and christian and i hope we will have either one of you back on the show to do like a traditional like a real episode right now great hobby as soon as it becomes something where i think i have to work for like a job that's probably when i'm gonna stop doing it but yeah that's i got my start after college covering actually during college covering uh, professional sports. Oh. And I told you I'm, I'm a football just fanatic, right? I was working for a Sports Illustrated subsidiary at the time. And as soon as they assigned me to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, my favorite football team, I was miserable. I hated watching the games because I had to. They had a Monday night game and I had to stay up till one o'clock in the morning to watch them lose by 56 points. I had to do it. I had to. And then I had to write about it from an objective place. And... I, I finished that season and they're like, do you want to take over the NFC South? And I was like, I would rather die. In fact, I quit. <laughs> I understand. I don't want to take up any more of your time than necessary. I just want to tell you, I really appreciate you taking a minute to chat with me. I'm glad that you came on. And that's another thing that with guests, I like them to ask me questions. And there are not a lot of guests that do it. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> It's not a comfortable thing. When I introduce the show, I say, hello, my name is Ben. And the person who I'm on with, they say their name. And I say, we are the hosts of the Two Vague Podcast this week. Because that's what I want it to feel like. It's just like a conversation. You, you can ask me anything. I can ask you anything. If it gets too personal or a place that we don't want to go, just say it. And I don't include it. So it's That's you know, exactly. You just cut it out. That yeah, doesn't. Would require a whole lot. I would love to be back after you know Pax is over. With anytime you guys want to have us on, um, or just me or Christian, whatever. Just give me like I don't know a week's notice. Like I said, having a one-year-old requires a little bit of yeah. coordination. Andrew's in the same boat. Baby CJ just was born just under a year ago, so he's also having the the same parental sort of hurdles and whatnot. So it's easier than they say, at least in my experience. But it's still really hard. This is your first then? Yeah. And his daughter, Star, has been on the show, and she is in her 20s. Wait, 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 whoa, whoa. He has a daughter in her 20s, and then he just had another one? Yes. He's my age. He just turned 50. He was, he was done. What's the... <laughs> I, you know, when you meet the right person, man, you just meet the right person. <laughs> I, I, don't, I guess that's fair, yeah. I can't answer for him on this, but yeah, his, his wife, who uh, um, also older, early 40s, I think, no children. Uh, so they just made the decision and there we, there we go. They've got their, their daughter and it's not, it's not Andrew's first rodeo. Um, and that's probably good. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Eric. Best of luck for you being the imaginary game studios booth, babe. That's right. Can you get me a sash, please? That I can wear? <laughs> yeah, we need to get you one of those uh, tiara too. Mm. I would. You, you bring it. I'll wear it. I'm telling you. I'll take photos <laughs> with you and everything. We'll catch up at the conference. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. All right. Bye. Have a good night. Yeah.